Tonight on Let It Rip, a Super Tuesday solidifying some familiar faces for November. Nikki Haley officially dropped out of the race, or did the primary set the stage for something else? Meantime, Trump swept Super Tuesday, likely setting up a Trump and Biden rematch. For President Biden, how much is riding on the State of the Union address? Could it stimulate or sink his campaign? We're diving into it all. But first, the uncommitted vote might not be the only thing impacting President Biden's support. Some black leaders claim the Democratic Party is taking the black vote for granted. What do the Dems need to do to stop the black voters' exodus that could put Trump back into office? Or is it too late for a course correction? That debate starts now. Time now to let it rip. We start with Mildred Gaddis, host of the Mildred Gaddis Show on 105.9. Sam Riddle, the Michigan National Action Network. Uh, we also have former Democratic State Representative Sherry Gay Dagnago and Eric Foster with the Oakland County Democratic Party. And of course, Fox 2 anchor and attorney Charlie Lincoln. He's everywhere and he's here right next to me. And we are in uh, Ruth Braj is in Washington, D.C. right now ahead of the State of the Union tomorrow. So I'm taking his place and we're going to let it rip right now. We're going to start with you, Mildred, because this weekend, this past weekend, you had tackled the topic of the uncommitted vote that we saw really came out in masses here in our state at least and really across the country you had a problem with it you feel after some uh, black leaders came out and said that they you know did vote uncommitted that they were basically turning their back on black voters well uh, I'm tied to history and uh, it seems to me that um, first of all let me say this my position didn't come after these people said they they were going sure. to be uncommitted. In response at this yeah. moment. Though. Yes, of course. Um, what didn't make sense to me is that um, the, the reason they, they were saying, some of them, was because of what the Democratic Party had not done for black Americans. The Democratic Party has always been who and what it is. So this time is no different when you look at it from a black perspective, if that's going to be your argument. Um, the people who led to Rashida Tlaib and the others who led that movement uh, created a reality that was not accurate. And, but they did a good job at it because historically, the uncommitted vote has always been about 11 percent. So I think they took it up by 2.5. But it's, it, you know, in a time where President Biden, the Democratic candidate apparently, is losing a lot of support, every vote might matter. And if you're pushing people not to, is it putting uh, the Democrats in a bad position? Oh, yeah, it, it, it may very well ultimately turn out to be that. But here's the thing. Um, at a time when um, democracy in this country is being threatened so severely, we cannot afford the luxury of not voting or supporting the candidate that most blacks the, uh, blacks are supporting. Doesn't mean they all should be or anything like that. So my question is, I kept asking, what's the real deal here? Why is this particular piece in terms of aligning them, uh, being aligned with people, with do, all due respect to what's happening in the Middle East, why are black people at this point saying, this guy is not good for us? Now, is that a, uh, well, a very not, not what is being said. I'm not going to argue with Sam. I'm going to answer your question. Truth, the reality is, is that if you really are a historian, I must tell you, you are adrift, and I don't know who taught you your history, but first of all, Rashida Tlaib is on point, accurate. 100% in terms of her assessment and the uncommitted vote is to save lives, to send a message that American tax dollars should not be used to commit genocide in Gaza. That well, that matters. Might be the case, and that's the and message that, that they're sending that with that vote. But are you also, there's also a large part of the population, and, and, and we're hearing that uh, black leaders feel like that they're disenfranchised. Oh, wait a minute. The I'm, the one, I'm one of the five delegates. In 1972, they refused to walk out when Coleman Young led the rest of the Democratic uh, mm -hmm. black folks out of Gary, Indiana. Me, Ed Vine, and three others refused to walk out. Coleman is not a deity, far from it. And the reality is that he was out of order then. The same thing being said now by those black folks you referenced, we lived it. We 
went to Gary. We organized. Out of that was born the Jackson candidacy. We heard the same crap about Jesse. You're happy with when the Michael Democratic Moore, the filmmaker, and I went down to pick up Jesse Jackson in 1983 to bring him back to a standing room only crowd in Flint, Michigan, Whiting Auditorium. We want to history. Right now, history. Some Sam, people right now, and 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 right, I know, and a lot of it has to do with that. But right so. now, with the Democratic Party, with President Biden, are you worried about losing the Democratic Party? No, hell no. What I'm worried about is the Democratic Party. What plantation are you on? You're on a plantation led by uh, an elephant or a jackass? A plantation is a plantation is a plantation. Sure. And right now, we're treated so like we're on a plantation. Let's, let's, uh, talk to Sherry here right now. I mean, Sherry, you've written, you've been part of articles and, and saying that you feel like sometimes every four years the Democratic Party comes around when it's convenient for them. Tara, go ahead and say what I really said. I said the Democratic Party treats black people like we're the help. There and, I, and I said it to political, I said it to AP, uh, I said it four years ago, and I said it a few weeks ago. The Democratic Party treat black people like we're the help. And I think it's unfair, and it, it's, it's odd that me and Sam are on the same page with respect to the uncommitted piece. I struggled. I walked into the polls. I, I went as late as I could because I actually came on your show that night. Mm -hmm. And um, I struggled. I went ahead and voted uh, for President Biden. Um, but, I, I, but I did pause for a moment to consider uncommitted. Uncommitted is not voting. And I've been hearing people saying that it's our right to vote. Yes, it is our right to vote. As somebody who has led the lawsuit um, against um, our state uh, and with AGV mm -hmm. Benson and dealing with redistricting, it's our right to have fair and black representation, but the party has utilized black votes splintering us out into Oakland and Macomb County, cutting us up because really, in, in, in essence, all they care about is the majority. And so now is a time where we don't negotiate from weakness, we negotiate from strength. And, and, and in doing that, this is a presidential election. It's time to have a come to Jesus meeting with the party so that black people can really get what we deserve um, as true voters if our votes really count as one vote. Eric, a lot of people are saying that the Democratic Party needs to course correct at this point. Do you feel that uh, the Democratic Party is taking black voters for granted? So I'm going to give you all a different perspective and I'm going to deal from some fact-based objective reality points. I'm going to say no. Now, at the OCDP, though, we do hear everything that people are saying and as one part of the larger organism of the Democratic Party universe, because it's not just the Oakland County Democratic Party. It's not just the Michigan Democratic Party. It's not just the Democratic National Committee. It's state representatives who are Democratic. It's state senators. It's county commissioners. It's city council people. It's Congress people. All of these individual groups collectively are doing engagement, they're educating their voters on different things that they're doing as it relates to policy. When Sherry was a state representative, she was engaging her voters, telling them what she was doing as a legislator. Now, overlap that with whoever the Democratic County Commissioner was, whoever the Democratic State Senator was, whoever the Democratic Congressional Member was. What I'm saying is that as a part of a ecosystem, and not counting all of the third party groups like Indivisible right. and Fair Fight and others, there has been a collective continuing engagement, sharing what needs to be done, what we're doing, what policies are what the hell from are you all about? different <laughs> groups. It's not just the Democratic Party. It's the Democratic ecosystem. Who has the budget? Who has the budget? Who has the budget? The Michigan Democratic Party has not provided any resources into the black community to do any of this lifting. And I'm glad that you said that I was engaging my voters because much of it I did on my own dime let me, let me, or money that I raised. You also, so member, you also all, as a state rep, were a member of the Democratic I, Party, I, I, so I, I, that's part of the No, that was not. No, that was not. That was not. No, but you did First of all, I did it because it was the right thing to do. And that's a part of the engagement. And that's a part of the engagement. First of all, I'm not black, okay? So if I am not. Second of all, that's an easy one. But here's the deal. If I'm looking at this objectively, if the issue, let's frame the issue, has the Democratic Party done good things for black voters so that black voters should just vote Democrat? And I'd say no. How many members of Congress, Democratic black members of Congress, are there from Michigan? Uh, none. Zero. John James. He's a Republican. He's not really. He's a Republican. He's not a Democrat. Oh, 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 Democrat. Oh
up. But where's the leadership from the Democratic Party? But but Charlie, need two, more but leadership. Two, 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 two,
To offer a bit of background, national political conventions such as the DNC are reoccurring national special security events, or NSSEs. This designation by the Department of Homeland Security allows the federal government to tap its full array of resources to develop event security and incident management plans. The Secret Service has a long proven track record of securing large scale events and is the lead agency in developing and implementing NSSE security plans. Again, our goal is to provide a safe and secure environment for the general public. Working for you, Fox 2 News at 10 starts now. A horrific scene in downtown Detroit. One person is dead, two others hurt after a pair of crashes on Woodward Avenue. Good evening, everyone. I'm Taryn Asher. Yeah, no, Brandon Hudson, quite a chaotic night. The driver is in custody, and we are learning more about what led up to the scene. Fox News' Lauren Edwards is working this story. She's been on it all night. Lauren, what do you know at this hour? Brandon Taren, I can tell you that just 30 minutes ago, the police cleared the scene behind me on Woodward and Temple, but for most of the night tonight, it was Detroit police and Wayne State police investigating the second crash. They say the first one happened less than a mile away. Now, DPD says at 5:11 this evening, a man in his 20s was driving a black sedan, speeding southbound on Woodward, approaching MLK when he had a man in his 60s walking by Wayne State Lieutenant Kerry. Glazer says his sergeant was na was nearby and he saw quote clothes clothes go up in the air. The driver then continued speeding down Woodward and then rear-ended another black sedan in front of Little Caesars Arena. The driver behind both crashes was arrested and taken to the hospital. Vehicle that was hit from the rear. He's uh, at the hospital. He's in temporary serious. He'll be okay. Um, the other driver. Um, he got out, uh, collapsed, but he's uh, actually temp serious as well, uh, and he'll be okay. So. What about the pedestrian? The pedestrian uh, did not make it, unfortunately. Now, Lieutenant Glazer says he doesn't know at this time if alcohol was the factor or if there was a medical episode that happened. He says that's all a part of the investigation, but he did confirm that no children were involved and the queue line was not impacted. We will get you updates on this case as we get them. Reporting live here, downtown Detroit, Lauren Edwards, Fox 2 News. Thanks for that report. As authorities work to find out what caused this massive inferno, sparking explosions in Clinton Township, we are learning more about the 19-year-old who was killed that night in that fire, since shrapnel, metal canisters flying miles away, one of those hit and killed that teenager. Yeah, so tragic. Fox News' Camille and Marie actually spoke with his pastor tonight. She's joining us live. And uh, what did we learn about uh, this, this teen, Camille? This is just a horrible, horrible story. Turner Salter was standing around this area where I am right now at this 24-hour gas station about a quarter of a mile away. He was watching just like everybody else when suddenly tragedy struck. Turner was a great kid. Uh, just an amazing person to be around. Turner Salter, just 19 years old, killed Monday night during that massive warehouse fire and explosion in Clinton Township. He was standing outside a car wash on Grossbeck, about a quarter of a mile away, watching things unfold when he was hit by a piece of shrapnel. It is definitely something that nobody prepares for. It's not something that uh, you anticipate. And certainly the family, the church, the community are facing things that um, are devastating. Turner was a lifelong member of Faith Baptist Church. He also volunteered there. He mostly uh, did things in our audiovisual department, our sound system. Uh, every Sunday he was running a camera. Senior Pastor Tim Berlin describes Turner as kind, gracious, and dependable. When he was working around here, you asked him something to do. He was incredibly responsible. He was going to do what you asked him to do, how, how he was supposed to do it. And you just knew it was going to get done. And because he was such a good person, it makes it that much harder to come to terms with what happened. Everything happens for a reason, but we don't always know the reason. The most important thing I think that Turner would want everyone to know is that he had eternal life in front of him because of his relationship with Christ. 
just 19 years old, had his life, whole life ahead of him. Just an incredibly sad story. Now, Faith Baptist Church is accepting donations for his family. We're putting a link on our website, fox2detroit.com, to their website. Uh, right at the very top of their website, you can click on there and donate to the family if you would like to. For now, we're live in Clinton Township. Camille and Mary, Fox 2 News. Sending our best to the family tonight. Thank you, Camille. Well, the search for a missing 13-year-old girl sends investigators to a secluded pond in Clinton Township. Michigan State Police spent the day searching for Naziah Harris. Sky Fox was over the scene this afternoon near Gratiot and 14 Mile. Harris was last seen on January 9th getting off her school bus on Detroit's east side. There have been no signs of her since. We had a quick reminder tonight that it is still winter. Yes. It was a cool night across <laughs> Metro Detroit. Good news is that things should really clear up by tomorrow. Yeah, turn on the heat, turn off the right. heat. That's what I feel like I've been doing every day. Rich Litterman standing by with our first look at the forecast. You know the story. It's oh, that same old so record. Sad. We're playing it here in Michigan. I notice where all the wet weather is well east of southeast Michigan through central Pennsylvania, parts of New York State. Around here, it's kind of chilly. 38 for us, 35 in Lansing, 37 out there in Grand Rapids. So just partly cloudy skies for the rest of tonight. Cool and dry. We'll get down to 36 on average and then more wet weather likely late in the day Friday, Friday night and Saturday. And how about that Sunday? Some flurries around here. We'll check the numbers in the seven day coming up in 20. Well, we have a jury selected for the James Crumley trial, but one potential juror into some trouble. I'll explain coming up. Tonight on the edge, a voter intimidation investigation in Plymouth Township. Police are trying to track down this guy you see on your screen. They say that he put a flashing light near a ballot box. The charges that he could face as tonight on the edge. statements will start tomorrow in the trial of the Oxford High School shooter's father. A jury is seated in James Crumley's involuntary manslaughter case, and it includes people who are parents, an expectant mother, and several gun owners. Fox 2 legal analyst Charlie Langton breaks down the people deciding his fate. 
lot of people thought it would take a little bit longer, but we do have a jury selected in the James Crumley trial. It only took about a day and a half or so. 15 jurors total. 12 will actually deliberate the case, and then three will be alternates. Six men, nine women, all white. 11 of them have kids. Seven of them have guns. Very important. James Crumley wanted those jurors to have kids. A couple of jobs from the jurors. One is an IT, a, then a graphic designer, a music teacher, foster care worker, an RM, and a nurse practitioner. One juror is actually pregnant. One juror did get into a little trouble. In the pool of 50 people, they had to, they were picked yesterday, they had to come back today. Well, one of them didn't come back, and the judge's clerk called that juror, and apparently that potential juror laughed at the judge saying, I'm not coming back. So the judge issued a bench warrant for that juror. That juror could spend some time in jail for blowing off jury duty, emphasizing the importance of jury duty. One other thing about James Crumley, he was very active in this case. He was taking notes. He actually participated in excusing some jurors. He wanted jurors with kids, and he got 11 of them of the 15 have kids. All right, early Thursday morning at 830, we will start with opening statements, and then the testimony begins. Outside the Oakland County Courthouse, Charlie Langton, Fox 2 News. It's the night before a major speech for President Joe Biden, his State of the Union address, and being an election year, he hopes it won't be his last. Fox 2 is the only station in Michigan invited to D.C. to cover the address. Our colleague, Rup Raj, joins us live from the nation's capital. After spending all day speaking with lawmakers, Rup, we've appreciated your work. It's been a busy day, man. It has been a busy day, and if you think it's a busy day for us, just wait until you hear what the president and his staff members have been working on. Uh, Fox 2 also getting some inside information from somebody in the know at the White House saying this president is right now at this hour busy practicing and rehearsing with his team this very important speech, one that will determine whether or not people continue to have trust in him when it comes to issues like climate change, reproductive rights, and gun rights as well. On a rainy Wednesday night, the eve of the State of the Union address. What's more, a shutdown this week is entirely avoidable. The floor filled with Republicans and Democrats today voting on funding the government. The same floor will serve as a bully pulpit, a platform for President Joe Biden to showcase what he's done and what he wants to do. Outgoing Michigan Democratic Senator Debbie Stabenow talking to Fox 2 about his agenda, but also his ability to do the job. Should Americans be worried about his cognition, his memory, his abilities? I'm not worried about Joe Biden, I bet. I, I work with him all the time. This is somebody who knows every world leader, who knows what's going on in Michigan, who doesn't miss a beat. It's not about age, it's about action. What I see is um, Republicans, that's all they've got. That's all I've got is his age, and that's accurate. His age is accurate, but is that sufficient when we see manufacturing jobs coming back when we see him taking on the drug companies. Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin also at the Capitol telling us she expects to hear about accomplishments that can be seen on the ground in Michigan. How much money do I have in my pocket? How much money do I save every month? How do I cover the insane costs of health care, prescription drugs, child care, housing now, just buying your first house? Um, and what's our path to a more comfortable place? I, 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 that's what I hear about probably more than anything. And um, obviously, inflation is still with us. It's not as bad as it was, but it's still there. And while Slotkin and Stabenow say those kitchen table economics, those issues are the most important to Michigan voters, I'll tell you, Congressman John James has another idea. Idea. It has to do with Homeland Security. What's most important is President Biden has the ability right now, what Customs and Border Patrol has said, when I went to go visit the Del Rio sector down at Eagle Pass, that just re-implementing the Remain in Mexico policy would reduce the influx of illegal immigration by 70%, 70%. That doesn't require anything from Congress, but it requires the president to actually put partisanship aside and put what's best for our nation in securing our border. Our national security is literally his job. He's been. Thursday, hours before the speech, Fox 2 has been invited to the White House to preview what the president plans to talk about. The only station in Michigan and Detroit to be given exclusive access to the White House. Hey, guys. 
And so climate change and, as we say, reproductive rights and also gun control measures will be talked about uh, at that State of the Union address. And at the White House, we are going to have exclusive access to cabinet members who are going to be talking to Fox 2 and nine other TV stations across the country, the only 10 stations invited to the White House to talk about the preview of the State of the Union address. And so it's going to be an exciting day. We're going to kick our morning off at the White House, going through some uh, big security measures to get in there and talk to these cabinet members throughout the day. Tomorrow, we're going to be bringing you the very latest at 5, 6, 10, and 11, and of course, online on fox2detroit.com. In Washington, Rupraj, Fox 2 News. You, you are certainly the right guy to get the job to do that, and uh, we look forward to your coverage tomorrow. But, Roop, uh, you know, it's interesting in terms of the people watching this speech, the voters. It's not just uh, some of those major issues, of course, that they'll be paying attention to, but it's really how President Biden delivers it, and they will be paying attention to every detail there. That's a really good point. I want you to think for a moment about all those Nikki Haley voters, people who, who were casting their ballots for Nikki Haley. They were, they were either never Trumpers, they were either loyal Republicans who just didn't want to go down the Trump train, and some conservative-leaning Democrats and independents. Many of them are going to be watching this speech, perhaps with fresh eyes, with the president, hoping for fresh ideas to lead us into the next four years. We shall see. All right, Rupe, and we will see you tomorrow from Washington, D.C. Thank you. See you then. Thank well, you. the State of the Union is a big topic on Let It Rip. It's widely viewed as one, as we mentioned, that could boost or sink President Biden's re-election campaign. But he could face another challenge, and it might be from a familiar face in this race, Nikki Haley. Did she really hang it up, or is there a third-party bid in the cards? And Arab voters aren't the president's only problem. Black voters, some of them say the Democratic Party's taking them for granted. And if the Dems don't change course, those pivotal voters might not show up. We're diving into it all. It starts in just a few minutes. I wouldn't know about a baby to get a roof. A major milestone for the Renew Detroit program, but there's still a lot of work to be done how it's helping low-income seniors in the city.
Well, major home repairs don't come cheap, and they're often unattainable for senior citizens on a fixed income. Yeah, some Detroit seniors are getting a new roof for free, and that's thanks in part to the federal government. As Fox News' Amy Lang tells us, crews just completed their 500th roof replacement. A new roof is just what this home needed and something its longtime owner only dreamed of. I would have never thought I'd be able to get a roof. Gwendolyn Forehand has lived here since 1981. The wind get high and some of the shingles was blowing off, you know. So. It's hard owning a house. Especially when it's an old home and you're a senior citizen on a fixed income. But that's exactly who the Renew Detroit program is designed for. I had a couple of leaks and they corrected that. And just being able to have something new. I'm glad that you're getting your new roof. I am too. <laughs> Very glad. <laughs> All thanks to the Renew Detroit Home Repair Program. This is possible today because President Biden and the American Rescue Plan got the city of Detroit $827 million. And City Council allocated $30 million of that to this program. We have some of the oldest housing stock in the country. And so when we're talking about seniors who are disabled or on fixed incomes, trying to make major repairs in their homes, they need assistance. The funding for the program should allow for 2,000 seniors right here in the city to get new windows or a new roof. The recipients have already been chosen, and last week, crews completed their 500th roof replacement at the home of Barbara Iron. Thank God for the work, the men's work, and the people coming and going. Thank God for whoever chose me to be one in the midst. Hansons and their crews have been instrumental in getting the job done, but with 1,500 more to go, the city is looking for more contractors to help finish the job. This is a call out to people who are licensed or certified to do home repairs. Sign up with the city become a vendor to help us complete this work. Your senior citizens need you, don't you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> On Detroit's east side, Amy Lang, Fox 2 News. I'm meteorologist Rick Schluter. Pretty quiet across the area. Cool and dry. 35 Pontiac, 38 Metro Airport, 39 up there in Port Huron. We'll see fair weather clouds come and go tonight on average down to 36. And then tomorrow, a mix of sun and clouds. Keep the umbrellas handy for Saturday, especially. We'll check that seven day forecast after the break.
today with mostly cloudy skies. We are watching three storms. One is over Southern California. The other is here churning north of the Dakotas in Minnesota. The big storm is out east. Look at all the wet weather around Washington and Philly, New York, up to Boston. We missed out on all of that action, that's for sure. In fact, over the last few hours, the clouds have thinned out nicely, so there are some stars out there, and that's why tomorrow it's going to be a quiet day with sun and clouds. 38 degrees right now. Still that breeze from the north and east, and that's keeping us rather chilly out there. 34 Howe, 34 in Flint, still 40 in Monroe, 39 in Windsor, but the direction shows it's from the north and northeast, that light breeze, and that is a chilly flow for us. 39 in Chicago, 29 in Newberry, there's 44 to our south in Columbus. A couple of warm spots for you, 73 in Dallas, close to 70 right now. Orlando, Florida. For us, it's going to be cool and dry tomorrow. Then our next weather maker comes at us late in the day, Friday into Saturday, as a slow moving front will bring us a round of wet weather to end the week. You'll see it all in the seven day forecast for the rest of tonight. Partly cloudy, cool and dry down to 36 on average. There'll be a few cooler spots in the northern suburbs tomorrow. Not a bad looking Thursday. Sun and clouds back up to 50 degrees and then check out the seven day. Some late day showers Friday. Saturday looks rainy and then flurries brisk and cooler for Sunday. Remember this weekend, Saturday night, spring forward. Brandon with the clocks. We'll see on the edge at 11. See you then, Rich. Well, Terry and the gang are getting ready to let it rip, or in this case, they'll be tearing it up. Shout out to our producers for that pun there. Key leaders in the black community say that the Democratic Party is taking them for granted. Of course, correction is needed now, and if they want them to show up in November. Plus, Super Tuesday had no surprises. Nikki Haley drops out, but is she done chasing the White House? A possible sink or swim speech for the president's re-election campaign. A special Wednesday version of Let It Rip is just two and a half minutes away.
let it rip. A Super Tuesday solidifying some familiar faces for November. Nikki Haley officially dropped out of the race, or did the primary set the stage for something else? Meantime, Trump swept Super Tuesday, likely setting up a Trump and Biden rematch. For President Biden, how much is riding on the State of the Union address? Could it stimulate or sink his campaign? We're diving into it all. But first, the uncommitted vote might not be the only thing impacting President Biden's support. Some black leaders claim the Democratic Party is taking the black vote for granted. What do the Dems need to do to stop the black voters' exodus that could put Trump back into office? Or is it too late for a course correction? That debate starts now. Time now to let it rip. We start with Mildred Gaddis, host of the Mildred Gaddis Show on 105.9. Sam Riddle, the Michigan National Action Network. Uh, we also have former Democratic State Representative Sherry Gay Dagnago and Eric Foster with the Oakland County Democratic Party. And of course, thanks to anchor and attorney Charlie Langton. He's everywhere and he's here right next to me. <laughs> and we are in uh, Ruth Raj is in Washington, D.C. right now ahead of the State of the Union tomorrow. So I'm taking his place and we're going to let it rip right now. We're going to start with you, Mildred, because this weekend, this past weekend, you had tackled the topic of the uncommitted vote that we saw really came out in masses here in our state, at least, and really across the country. You had a problem with it. You feel, after some uh, black leaders came out and said that they, you know, did vote uncommitted, that they were basically turning their back on black voters. Well, uh, I'm tied to history. And uh, it seems to me that, um, first of all, let me say this. My position didn't come after these people said they they were going to sure. be uncommitted. In response be, at this yeah, moment. Though. Yes, of course. Um, what didn't make sense to me is that um, the, the reason they, they were saying, some of them, was because of what the Democratic Party had not done for black Americans. The Democratic Party has always been who and what it is. So this time is no different when you look at it from a black perspective, if that's going to be your argument. Um, the people who led to Rashida Tlaib and the others who led that movement uh, created a reality that was not accurate. And, but they did a good job at it because historically, the uncommitted vote has always been about 11 percent. So I think they took it up by 2.5. But it, it, you know, in a time where President Biden, the Democratic candidate, apparently is losing a lot of support, every vote might matter. And if you're pushing people not to, is it putting uh, the Democrats in a bad position? Oh, yeah, it, it, it may very well ultimately turn out to be that. But here's the thing. Um, at a time when um, democracy in this country is being threatened so severely, we cannot afford the luxury of not voting or supporting the candidate that most blacks the, uh, blacks are supporting. Doesn't mean they all should be or anything like that. So my question is, I kept asking, what's the real deal here? Why is this particular piece in terms of aligning them, uh, being aligned with people, with do, all due respect to what's happening in the Middle East, why are black people at this point saying, this guy is not good for us? Now, is that a, uh, well, a see, very... Well, it's not what is being said. I'm not going to argue with Sam. I'm going to answer you your the question. Truth, the reality is, is that if you really are a historian, I must tell you, you are adrift, and I don't know who taught you your history, but first of all, Rashida Tlaib is on point, accurate, 100% in terms of her assessment and the uncommitted vote is to save lives, to send a message that American tax dollars should not be used to commit genocide in Gaza. That well, that matters. Might be the case, and that's the and message that, that they're sending that matters. with that vote. But are you also, there's also a large part of the population, and, and, and we're hearing that uh, black leaders feel like that they're disenfranchised. Holy, wait a minute. The I'm, the one, I'm one of the five delegates. 
1972 that refused to walk out when Coleman Young led the rest of the Democratic uh, mm -hmm. black folks out of Gary, Indiana. Me, Ed Vine, and three others refused to walk out. Coleman is not a deity, far from it. And the reality is that he was out of order then. The same thing being said now by those black folks you referenced, we lived it. We went to Gary. We organized. Out of that was born the Jackson candidacy. We heard the same crap about Jesse. You're happy when with Michael the Moore, the filmmaker, and I went down to pick up Jesse Jackson in 1983 to bring him back to a standing room only crowd in Flint, Michigan, Whiting Auditorium. We want to history. Right now, history. Some people right now, I know, and a lot of it has to do with that, but right so. now, with the Democratic Party, with the Democratic Party, are you worried about losing the Democratic Party? Is a Democratic Party. What plantation are you on? You're on a plantation led by uh, an elephant or a jackass? A plantation is a plantation is a plantation. Sherry, and right now we're treated like we're on a plantation. Let's, let's uh, talk to Sherry here right now. I mean, Sherry, you've written, you've been part of articles and, and saying that you feel like sometimes every four years the Democratic Party comes around when it's convenient for them. Sarah, go ahead and say what I really said. I said the Democratic Party treats black people like we're the help. There and, I, and I said it to political, I said it to AP, uh, I said it four years ago, and I said it a few weeks ago. The Democratic Party treat black people like we're the help. And I think it's unfair, and it, it's, it's odd that me and Sam are on the same page with respect to the uncommitted piece. I struggled. I walked into the polls. I, I went as late as I could because I actually came on your show that night. Mm -hmm. And um, I struggled. I went ahead and voted uh, for President Biden, uh, but, I, I, but I did pause for a moment to consider uncommitted. Uncommitted is not voting, and I've been hearing people saying that it's our right to vote. Yes, it is our right to vote. As somebody who has led the lawsuit um, against um, our state uh, and with AG V. Mm -hmm. Benson and dealing with redistricting, it's our right to have fair and black representation, but the party has utilized black votes splintering us out into Oakland and Macomb County, cutting us up, because really, in, in, in essence, all they care about is the majority. And so now is the time where we don't negotiate from weakness, we negotiate from strength. And, and, and in doing that, this is a presidential election, it's time to have a come to Jesus meeting with the party so that black people can really get what we deserve um, as true voters, if our votes really count as one vote. Eric, a lot of people are saying that the Democratic Party needs to course correct at this point. Do you feel that uh, the Democratic Party is taking black voters for granted? So I'm going to give you all a different perspective and I'm going to deal from some fact-based objective reality points, I'm going to say no. Now, at the OCDP, though, we do hear everything that people are saying, and as one part of the larger organism of the Democratic Party universe, because it's not just the Oakland County Democratic Party, it's not just the Michigan Democratic Party, it's not just the Democratic National Committee, it's state representatives who are Democratic, it's state senators, it's county committees. Commissioners, it's city council people, it's Congress people. All of these individual groups collectively are doing engagement, they're educating their voters on different things that they're doing as it relates to policy. When Sherry was a state representative, she was engaging her voters, telling them what she was doing as a legislator. Now, overlap that with whoever the Democratic County Commissioner was, whoever the Democratic State Senator was, whoever the Democratic Congressional Member was. What I'm saying is that as a part of a ecosystem, and not counting all of the third party groups like Indivisible right. and Fair Fight and others, there has been a collective continuing engagement, sharing what needs to be done, what we're doing, what policies are what the hell from are all about? different <laughs> groups. It's not just, it's not just it's not the Democratic Party, it's the Democratic ecosystem. Who has the budget? Who has the budget? So, who has the budget? The Michigan Democratic Party has not any resources into the black community to do any of this lifting and I'm glad that you said that I was engaging my voters because much of it I did on my own dime let me, let me, or money that I raised. You also, so member, so you also all, as a state rep were a member of the Democratic I, Party so I, I, that's part of the No, that was not. No, that was not. Has the Democratic Party done good things for black
black voters. So that black voters should just vote Democrat. And I'd say no. How many members of Congress, Democratic black members of Congress, are there from Michigan? Uh, no. John James. He's Republican. not really. He's 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 not really. He's
now on Let Rip, tackling the big week in presidential politics from Super Tuesday to the State of the Union address. With us right now, public relations guru and Democratic commentator Greg Bowens, Oakland University political science professor Dave Dulio, and then we have Republican strategist Jason Cable Rowe. Charlie, back with us again. Um, all right, Greg, let's talk about tomorrow being uh, such a big, pivotal moment, mm -hmm. supposedly for President Biden. People are going to hear from him. A lot of people we've heard have lost faith or maybe in his ability because of his age. How much is at stake with the speech tomorrow? Every uh, every time they do the State of the Union, it always seems like there's something really big at stake. Uh, certainly the things that are happening on the world stage as a relationship to Gaza, Ukraine, mm -hmm. and all this stuff, those issues are front and center. And where do we stand as a country, as a beacon of freedom? Are we Do we still stand for that? And what is our commitment to that? So I'm certain that folks will be paying attention to that. Are you worried? Well. Am I worried? No, I'm not worried. Not worried. He's He's given. A speech before. And there's a lot. Uh, it's a joke, certainly, but there's a lot. He's given a juggle. speech before, but you know, what are the expectations that we have as Americans? And one thing about Joe Biden, as as a person, he is decent, and and that comes across. I think every time he gives a speech, the sense of decency, the sense of kindness, the sense of fairness, comes across, and we need that as a country. And it's good to be reminded that we're not waking up every day with our hair on fire because we got an idiot in there who's screaming about. You know, yeah. this well, and that. The, that uh, particular candidate seems to be uh, doing quite well in the polls. And Dave, what do you think, though? What are voters expecting to hear, though, from the president to be able to solidify maybe their vote come November? Well, I think that depends on the voter, right? I mean, I think people are looking for a lot of different things, but to Israel your, and uh, Hamas sir, is a big plus part some of domestic it. stuff, right? Immigration is is at the top of almost every poll that we see uh, across the country as the most important issue. But back to Greg's point, the I, I think in your original question. I, I think this is a, a very critical moment for the president. This is a high leverage situation. If he delivers this speech without you know, a, a, a stumble or any problems like he's had in the past. Maybe that puts those uh, those issues of concern of, of his age aside for the time being. But if he stumbles, if he has a problem, um, it's just going to feed the flames of what voters are concerned about with his candidacy. And Jason, we've seen that Nikki Haley officially dropped out. Going forward, what could we see um, in terms of that? Is she? Could we see her run? We've heard a lot about this no label party. They're looking for a candidate right now. Um, if so, could that hurt President Trump's chances in November? Take votes away. Well, if she did run on the no labels ticket, I think she would draw from both. And I think you know we're eight months away from actual election day, so there is a lifetime, uh, many lifetimes of uh, politics uh, ahead of us. If she did get in, however, I think she becomes formidable if I wouldn't necessarily say she's in a position to win, but she can change the trajectory of either campaign and she can put states that might be leaning one candidate or the other today in a completely different place with her candidacy. I do think regardless of you know any protestations she's offering, it's the one thing that makes uh, her staying in the race as long as she has make any sense. There's never been a rational reason for her to be in, you know, pr frankly, since losing in her home state of South Carolina by 20 points, then coming to Michigan and losing by 40 points. Mm -hmm. There was no plausible reason. There was no corporate board she was going to get by staying in longer. Her book wasn't going to be more interesting by staying in longer. No one could really figure out what the motivation is. So well, no would labels it potentially makes the be, most though, sense. replace uh, Donald Trump if, you know, maybe but, something. I, he was pulled because of some charges and uh, in, in the absence of no labels that was probably the next best mm -hmm. uh, situation what might disqualify Trump and her be the last woman standing in a position to, to pick up the mantle of the Republican nomination but as you mentioned in the polling Republican voters frankly and it's not limited to MAGA anymore mm -hmm. um, uh, don't really care about the the legal jeopardy that he's in it's not, if he gets convicted of something I don't think that most people are going to say, oh, he was guilty after all, I think they're going to think, oh, they finally found a way to get him. 
Well, if he's convicted, though, I, that could change the scheme. But obviously, there's a long way to go with that. Go ahead, Chuck. I think Nikki Haley was was hoping that Donald Trump would be convicted more so than Biden was. I really, something. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't think Nikki Haley's got a really a third party chance. It's very difficult to raise money in 50 states. You've got a mount of campaign that is incredible. The thing about Trump is he can self fund still still self fund most of his campaign, and it makes him a, an attractive candidate. And you've got Nikki Haley. I don't know if she's got a lot of money. I don't think she does. She didn't raise much but, here. But there are the Nikki Haley voters out there Not that, that aren't many. happy with Biden, that aren't happy with Trump, that want their voices heard. There are, there minimal, minimal, there are minimal, more people in this minimal. country today than ever clamoring for a third option, wanting to see a third party uh, present itself as a... As a as, oh, it, like a Ross uh, Perot? Uh, uh, <laughs> I think they would want them to yeah, be but, better uh, than uh, Ross Perot. Yeah, uh, I want to be, be a rock star and I can't play guitar. Fair. I can't sing either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, we can win, of course. But it's never... You need a... Who, who is it? You need someone that can self-fund the campaign at this stage in the game, and you need someone with name recognition that's going to resonate across the entire country, and the ability to pick hardcore Democratic voters and maybe uh, Arab or Muslim or African American voters from the party on both sides. It's not. I can't imagine it's going to happen. Well, I will say, I think uh, Nikki. Haley has gotten more Democratic votes in the last three months than any Republican ever has before because mm -hmm. there have been so many Democrats yeah. participating that, if only to register a protest of Donald Trump. But that's Trump. what it is. In the primary I, scheme and that I, we have, the Democrats are crossing and, over. And, and I would, I I would qualify. I mean, I, I've talked to some of the funders of No Labels, and we're talking about billionaires. We're not right. talking about small-dollar guys mm -hmm. that have been looking for a candidate. And I think they thought they were going to have Joe Manchin. I think there were a couple other people that, you know, maybe a Larry Hogan that was attractive, they've all taken themselves out of consideration. And all of a sudden, they got Nikki Haley here, who's just come off running a national campaign. She's got high name ID. She's demonstrated some appeal, even if it's manufactured for Democrats and crossover uh, independents. So I, I think she's as viable an option as she, any of no but, labels but, options would be. But Greg, been. if yeah. the president doesn't I, make progress when it comes to what's going on in Gaza, if you know, a ceasefire, let's mm -hmm. say, and if border uh, security isn't tightened, or if, if anything that really people are so concerned about, that could cost him the election. Well, there are lots of things that can cost anybody an election going into uh, into November. And like you said, we got a long way to go before we get there. One of the things I think that's really important is, is that we are not talking when it comes to a third party about really how that person or persons can bring people together mm -hmm. in a way that we haven't seen before. And yeah. this this is the problem. This is this is the challenge. You're the professor. You're, you're on that side. The uh, 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 what, when it comes to the Republican Party, the way it is today, it is us versus them. It is grievance all the way live. And I'm telling you, that is not going to fly in a general election. There has to be there has to be a bigger vision for where we're going to be to get to that shining but city on the hill. There are issues out there that are dividing the country and dividing Republicans and Democrats. But Americans, and we've, always, we've, always we've always been divided. We've always been divided. We've always been divided. We've always been divided. That is the nature of being an American. That is the nature of democracy for us to argue about issues and then come together and move forward as a country when we're faced with a big I think that's problem. A great, I think it's a great point, but I think this election cycle more than any in, that I can remember is going to be about negative partisanship, about why the other guy is bad. We can And we can certainly talk about how negative things usually are, but I think this is going to boil down to the Biden campaign saying uh, Trump is a criminal and the Trump campaign saying Biden is too old. And, and, and voters are looking for something uh, else, I think, mm -hmm. given the flaws of these candidates, but they, uh, they have to, to your point, give them a reason uh, to support that. But I, but I would say, underscoring what you're saying, uh, Donald Trump's best ally in this campaign is Joe Biden, and Joe Biden's best ally in this campaign is Donald Trump. Yes. They are both disliked, they are both unwanted, and without one, the other would not exist. You take out either one, debate? and the other one loses all the momentum that they have. What about a debate, though? We haven't seen Donald Trump, Trump called, show up. He, right? he called for one today yeah. with the president. With Will the president. it happen? I mean, that's the question. Well, that, that, that I think fun. that would, a lot of people would think that would be uh, a good TV. Be oh, but it's kind of like vote for the person you hate the, the least. least. Lesser of two evils. Uh, so, I don't know. I, no, it's, it's, you got to vote for the person that is going to give you the confidence about going forward. People like to talk about the economy and they forget, they will forget that it was four years ago that the economy was tanked because of the pandemic. Now, gas was cheap because nobody was driving. 
right? I don't want to take Charlie's <laughs> job, but, but qu real quick question. Yes. Does uh, the, the prospect of President Kamala Harris hurt the Biden campaign? Uh, if that was the case, then she then he wouldn't have been elected in the first place. Well, we're starting to see more of her as of late. We <laughs> haven't seen her, really, I feel like, in the forefront in the last few years. We are going to come back in a few moments with final thoughts, so stay with us. All right, Greg. Final thoughts, 10 seconds each. What do you, what do you want to hear Biden say tomorrow? I'd like to hear uh, Biden speak to something that's pretty inspirational about where we can go and put it in the context of a bigger picture. It's not just mm -hmm. Trump is bad, you know, but it is that we can achieve, we can do, Dave? and we will. Uh, I, it'll be interesting to see how the president straddles campaigning versus governing tomorrow in a speech that is really about setting priorities for the next year. Jason, mm -hmm. surprises. I just want to see if he can get through it without misspeaking or stumbling. All right. That's it. And Charlie, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, be watching. we'll be watching. We'll be watching and we'll be covering it. So thank you all for being here, uh, for joining us tonight. And that does it for this edition of Let It Rip.